The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins Dramatised by Doug Lucy Episode 4 In the spring of the year 1849, I was back to my old ways, wandering Franklin Blake again. I was travelling in the east when one day I received a letter with the news that my father had died and that I had now inherited his great fortune. His solicitor, Mr. Bruff, entreated me to lose no time in returning to England, and by daybreak the next morning, I was on my way back to my own country. Just one final signature here, Mr. Blake, and that's the business side of things satisfactorily wound up. There. Perfect. Mr. Bruff, what news of Miss Verinder? Have you not spoken to her since your return? Well, she refuses to see me and ignores my letters. Well, on leaving England, she was the last person in the world whose name I would have suffered to pass my lips. On returning to England, she was the first person I inquired after. I take it you heard about the short-lived engagement to Mr. Godfrey Abelwood? Oh, yeah. But I've yet to hear a satisfactory account of their motives for recalling the marriage promise. Are you at liberty to enlighten me? Alas, no. Oh. Their motives are kept private between themselves. Then I shall ask you no more questions on the subject. However, I will tell you my immediate plans. I'm going to Yorkshire by the next train. May I ask for what purpose? Mr. Bruff, the assistance I innocently rendered to the inquiry after the diamond was an unpardonable offence in Rachel's mind, and it remains so nearly a year since. Huh? I won't accept that position. I am determined to find out the secret of her silence towards her mother and her enmity towards me. If time, pains and money can do it, I will lay my hand on the thief who took the moonstone. There are missing links in the evidence as I left it, which Gabriel Betteridge can supply. So, to Yorkshire I go. Betteridge? Whoa, oh, Mr. Franklin! <laughs> Goodness! Now, what brings you here? Well, I come to see you, my dear fellow. Walk in, Mr. Franklin. I'll ask what you want with me later. I must make you comfortable first. No, it vexes me to disappoint you, but the house is Miss Verinder's house now. Could I eat in it or sleep in it after what happened? The commonest sense of self-respect forbids me to cross the threshold. I am heartily sorry for this. I'd hoped here that things were all smooth and pleasant again between you and Miss Rachel. Nevertheless, I'm burning to know what's brought you here in this sudden way. What brought me here before? <laughs> the Moonstone, Mr. Franklin. But what brings you now, sir? The Moonstone again, Betteridge. I've come back to do what nobody has done yet. To find out who took the diamond. <laughs> How can you hope to succeed when Sergeant Cuff himself made a mess of it? Sergeant Cuff? The greatest policeman in England. My mind is made up, my old friend. By the by, I may want to speak to him sooner or later. Oh, Sergeant won't help you, sir. Why not? The great Cuff has retired from business. He's got a little cottage in Dorking, and he's up to his eyes in the growing of roses. Well, then I must do without Sergeant Cuff's help. Uh, do you remember that poor girl of ours? Rosanna Spearman. Well, of course. You always saw she had some sort of confession yeah. which she wanted to make well, to you. I certainly couldn't account for her strange conduct in any other way. Ah, well, you may set that doubt at rest, Mr. Franklin, whenever you please. Rosanna Spearman left a sealed letter behind her. A letter addressed to you. Well, where is it? In the possession of a friend of hers, Limpin Lucy, a lame girl with a crutch. Well, the fisherman's daughter. Ah, the same. Um, Limpin Lucy has a will of her own, sir. She wouldn't give it into any hands but yours. Well, let's go, Betteridge. We must get it at once. Well, as you wish, sir. I'll have the groom prepare a carriage. Excellent. Give a knock, sir. 
Yes. This is Mr. Franklin Blake. Mr. Betteridge. Mention his name again, if you please. This gentleman's name is Mr. Franklin Blake. Wait here. Well, I'll give you two some privacy. You mind your tongue, go girl. Thank you, Betteridge. Is that the letter you have to give to me? I want to look at you. No, I can't find out what she saw in your face. I can't guess what she heard in your voice. <laughs> My poor dear. What could you see in this man? Can you sleep? Yes. When you see a poor girl in service, do you feel no remorse? Certainly not. Why should I? Here. The letter. Take it. I never set eyes on you before. God Almighty forbid I should ever set eyes on you again. Well, sir. I can only suppose she is mad. Walk on. What does it say? For mercy's sake, sir, tell us, what does a letter say? Wait. There's a note attached to it. Sir, if you are curious to know the meaning of my behaviour to you whilst you were staying in the house of my mistress, do what you were told to do in the memorandum enclosed with this, and do it without any person being present to overlook you. Your humble servant, Rosanna Spin. Uh, what does the memorandum say? To go to the shivering sand at the turn of the tide. To walk out on the South Spit until you get the beacon and the flagstaff at the Coast Guard station in line together. To lay down on the rocks, a stick to guide your hand exactly in the line of the beacon and the flagstaff. To feel along the stick, among the seaweed, for a chain to run your hand along the chain until you come to the part of it which stretches over the edge of the rocks down into the quicksand. And then, to pull up the chain. Sergeant Cuff said it. From first to last, sir, the sergeant said she'd got a memorandum of the hiding place. And here it is. When's the turn of the tide? No, uh, an hour's time. Then come along, Betteridge. To the quicksand? To the quicksand. And perhaps... The solving of this cursed mystery. Trot on! Trot on! So, the stick is in line with the beacon and the flagstaff. So, remember what the letter said. You are charged when you make your discovery to make it alone. Besides, there's nothing in the letter against you letting out the secret afterwards. No, you're quite right. Oh, this is such a desolate place, Betteridge. I imagine to meet one's end in this vile quicksand. Now, the mere thought of it shrivels my soul. Well, I, for one, will never feel happy here ever again. I hate the place as I hate the devil. <laughs> I'll wait on the beach, sir. I felt along the line traced with the stick and felt the edge of the rocks. An inch or two further on, in a narrow fissure, I felt the chain. In this position, with my face within a few feet of the surface of the quicksand, shivering the hideous menace and the threat of death, I looked away from it and breathed in deeply. Then taking a firm hold of the seaweed with my left hand, I laid myself down over the brink and felt with my right hand under the overhanging rocks. I drew the chain up. To my amazement. 
amazement, there was a, a japanned tin case fastened to the end of it. I held it up for Betteridge to see and struggled along the slippery rocks to the safety of the beach and there, prized off the lid. <sighs> what the devil is this? What's in it, Mr. Franklin? It's a, it's a nightgown. And look, look, look here. The smear of paint from the, the door of Rachel's room. It is the sergeant said, sir. Find out who the garment with a stain on it belonged to. Find out how the person can account for having been in the room, and you haven't far to look for the hand that took the diamond. Perhaps Rosanna's letter tells us the name of the owner. Well, there's a shorter way to discover it than that. The nightgown must be marked with the owner's name. Oh, of course. Of course. <gasps> Whose name is it, sir? See for yourself. But it can't be. That's your name. Franklin Blake. I have penetrated the secret which the quicksand has kept from every other living creature. And on the unanswerable evidence of the paint stain, I have discovered myself as the thief. We drove back to the house and went into Betridge's little sitting room. My resolution not to enter Rachel's house was now completely forgotten. Now, Mr. Franklin, there's one thing certain at any rate. This nightgown is a liar. I am as innocent of all knowledge of having taken the diamond as you are. But there is the witness against me. The paint on the nightgown and the name on it are facts. Take a drop of grog, Mr. Franklin, and you'll get over the weakness of believing in facts. Oh, foul play, sir. That's how I read the riddle. What of that letter that was with the garment? I shall be dead and gone, sir, when you find my letter. Do you remember when you came out from among the sand hills that morning, looking for Mr. Betteridge? You were the most adorable human creature I'd ever seen. If you had known how I used to cry with the misery of your never noticing me, perhaps you would have given me a look now and then to live on. My work, sir, was to make your bed and to put your room tidy. It was the happiest hour I had in the whole day. There was your nightgown on the bed. I took it up to fold it and saw the stain of the paint from Miss Rachel's door. Here was the proof that you were in Miss Rachel's sitting room between 12 and 3 the previous night. Read the rest for yourself, Betteridge. If there is anything in it that I must look at, you can tell me as you go on. I understand you, Mr. Franklin. Having determined to keep the nightgown, the next thing was to discover how to keep it without the risk of being found out. There was only one way. To make another exactly like it, before Saturday came and brought the laundry inventory with it. I'd made up my mind that the hand which had taken Miss Rachel's jewel could by no possibility be any other hand than yours. You had left one of your rings upstairs. And when I brought it to you, you looked up at me so coldly. And I had got the dress that was the only proof against you. I'm afraid to tell you how I felt then. You would hate my memory forever afterwards. Do you see your way out of this dreadful mess yet? I see my way back to London to consult Mr. Bruff. But if he can't help me and the sergeant won't leave his retirement, then Betteridge... I am at the end of my resources. Oh. I don't know of a living creature who can be of the slightest use to me. Oh. Come in, whoever you are. The door opened, and there entered to us the most remarkable-looking man that I had ever seen. His complexion was of a swarthy darkness. His fleshless cheeks had fallen into deep hollows, and over the top of his head his hair was of the deep black which was its natural colour, while round the sides of his head it had turned completely white. Oh, I beg your pardon. I had no idea that Mr. Betteridge was engaged. 
I have the list for next week. Oh, why? Good day, sir. Good day. <sighs> Who is that? Ah, that's Dr. Candy's assistant. The doctor never recovered from that illness he caught on the night of Miss Rachel's birthday. And now the work all falls to his assistant. Not much of it now, except among the poor. You don't seem to like him, Betteridge. Oh, nobody likes him, sir. But why is he so unpopular? Well, his appearance is again him to begin with. There's a story that Mr Candy took him with a very doubtful character. Well, nobody knows who he is, and he hasn't a friend of the place. May I ask what's on that piece of paper? Oh, it's only the weekly list of the sick people here about. But my lady always had a regular distribution of good sound port and sherry among the infirm poor. And Miss Rachel wishes the custom to be kept up. And um, what is the man's name? Yeah, as ugly a name as need be. Ezra Jennings. Ah. Now, sir, if you take my advice, you'll keep the letter in the cover until these present anxieties have come to an end. It will sorely distress you whenever you read it. Upon my return to London, I went immediately to Mr Bruff's residence at Hampstead. He examined the nightgown, then devoted himself to the reading of Rosanna Spearman's letter. This is a very serious matter in more respects than one. Rachel's extraordinary conduct is no mystery now. She believes you have stolen the diamond and she must be persuaded to tell us on what grounds she bases that belief. But how? The mark of your name proves the nightgown to be yours and the mark of the paint proves the nightgown made the smear on Rachel's door. But what evidence is there to prove that you were the person who wore it on the night when the diamond was lost? Well, that point had occurred to me also. As to Rosanna Spearman's confessions, without alluding to the woman's career as a thief, I will merely remark that her letter proves her to have been an adept at deception. And I argue from that that I am justified in suspecting her of not having told the whole truth. I distinctly assert that it was in her character to have stolen the diamond. What do you say to that? But suppose it turns out that I did wear the nightgown. Let us wait and see whether Rachel hasn't suspected you on the evidence of the nightgown only. When is she next to visit your house, Mr. Bruff? The day after tomorrow, for lunch with my wife and daughters. Might you be able to prevail upon them to leave a short portion of time during which... I might speak to Rachel. I'm sure they would do as I ask, provided I furnish them with reason enough. If you come in by the back way, Rachel will be in the conservatory. But be careful, sir, not to cause that young lady any needless distress. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bruff. I will. <laughs> I remember the time, Rachel, when you could have told me that I'd offended you in a worthier way than that. Perhaps I have some excuse after what you've done. Is it a manly action on your part to find your way to me as you have found it today? If my honour was not in your hands, I would leave you this instant and never see you again. I have kept your infamy a secret, and I have suffered the consequences of concealing it. You were once a gentleman. You were once dear to my mother and dearer still to me. I have come here with something serious to say to you. Will you hear me? Did Rosanna Spearman show you the nightgown, yes or no? Are you mad? They say your father's death has made you a rich man. Have you come here to compensate me? For the loss of my diamond? Or is there a motive of shame at the bottom of all the falsehood? You have done me an infamous wrong. You suspect me of stealing your diamond. I have a right to know the reason why. Suspect you? You villain, 
I saw you take the diamond with my own eyes. Rachel, I can only speak the truth as you have spoken it. You saw me with your own eyes. You, you, you saw me take the diamond. Before God who hears us, I declare, I now know I took it for the first time. Do you doubt me still? Hmm? Rachel, tell me everything you saw that night. Why go back to it? Because we are the victim of some monstrous delusion which has worn the mask of truth. Tell, tell me what you saw. I had gone to blow out the candle in the outer room, where the diamond was. And as I did so, the door opened and I saw you in your nightgown with a candle in your hand. And what did I do? You went straight to the Indian cabinet, opened the drawer containing the diamond, put in your hand and took the diamond out. Then you stood quite still, as if thinking, until you roused yourself on a sudden and went straight out of the room. And did nothing happen from that time to the time the whole house knew the diamond was lost? Nothing. I never slept that night. I never went back to my bed. And now I'll tell you what I should have told you then. My heart, darling, you are a thief. You have crept into my room under the cover of night and stolen my diamond. I... You villain! I would have lost 50 diamonds rather than see your face lying to me as you have since that night. Why did you come here? Are you afraid I shall expose you? I can't expose you. I can't tear you out of my heart even now. You shall know that you have wronged me yet. Or you shall never see me again. Franklin! I forgive you! Oh, Franklin! Franklin! That evening, I was surprised at my lodgings by a visit from Mr. Bruff. Uh, please take a seat, Mr. Bruff. Thank you. I've... Just return Rachel to her guardian aunt, Miss Meridew, at Portland Place. I can hardly hold you responsible for the shock this unlucky interview has inflicted on her. Oh, no. May I depend on your making no second attempt to see her? You may rely on me. Then that's settled. Now, about the future. Well, I confess I have no idea where to turn that. Hear me, then. Yeah. What do we believe was done with the Moonstone when it was taken to London? It was pledged to Mr. Luca. And we know that you are not the person who pledged it. Do we know who did? No. And where do we believe the Moonstone to be now? In the keeping of Mr. Luca's bankers. Exactly. Hmm. Now, observe. We are already in the month of June. Towards the end of the month, a year will have elapsed from the time when we believe the jewel to have been pledged. By the terms of his agreement, Mr. Luca has to remove the diamond from the bank and give it to the person who pledged it. So am I free to try on my side what can be done by keeping a lookout at the bank? Certainly. Next day, I took the train to Yorkshire to call on the doctor, Mr. Candy, who I'd been informed in a letter from Gabriel Betteridge urgently wished to speak to me. But my visit was of no immediate assistance. Poor Mr. Candy's mind was irreparably damaged by his fever, and though he well remembered sending word that he wanted to speak to me, he had no recollection of what he wanted to speak about. As I left, I came face to face again with the apparition that was Ezra Jennings. I'm afraid, sir, you find Mr. Candy sadly changed. Uh, regrettably so. Are you walking my way, Mr. Jennings? I'm going to call on my aunt, Mrs. Ablewhite. I have a patient to see, and am indeed walking part of that way. Oh, excellent. Mm. 
Mr. Candy's illness must have been far more serious than I supposed. It is almost a miracle that he lived through it. Is his memory never any better than I have found it today? Of something which happened before he was taken ill? Yes. It may be possible to trace Mr. Candy's lost recollection without the necessity of appealing to Mr. Candy himself. How? I have had the presumption to occupy my leisure for some years past in writing a book addressed to the members of my profession, a book on the intricate subject of the brain and the nervous system. It has often occurred to me to doubt whether we can justifiably infer, in cases of delirium, that the loss of the faculty of speaking connectedly implies of necessity the loss of the faculty of thinking connectedly as well. Poor Mr. Candy's illness gave me an opportunity of putting this doubt to the test. I understand the art of writing in shorthand, and I was able to take down the patient's wanderings exactly as they fell from his lips. Do you see what I am coming to? Did my name occur in any of this? For nearly the whole of one night, Mr. Candy's mind was occupied with something between himself and you. The product is an intelligible statement. First, of something actually done in the past, and secondly, of something which Mr. Candy contemplated doing in the future. Well, let us go back directly and look at the papers, sir. Mr. Blake, is it too much to ask if I request you only to hint to me what your interest is in the lost recollection. Well, may we simply say that it has to do with the loss of the Moonstone? Hmm? Then I am sorry to have raised your expectations, Mr. Blake. Not one word about the diamond escaped Mr. Candy's lips throughout his illness. Oh, but it is at the bottom of it, Mr. Jennings. I will be short with you so that you may understand my agitation. I am accused by a witness of having taken the diamond. And yet I know I did not. At least I have no recollection of doing so. And I am thus degraded in the eyes of the one person whose estimation I most value in the world. Do you mind resting a little, Mr. Blake? No, no of course not. Uh, thank you. I am not what I was. A horrible accusation has rested on me for years. I am a man whose life is a wreck and whose character is gone. So the accusation has died out? No, it's as active as ever, but when it follows me here, it will come too late. You'll have left this place. No, Mr. Blaine. I shall be dead. For ten years, I have suffered from an incurable internal complaint. I have resisted the disease only by such palliative measures as I could devise. The one effective palliative in my case is opium. To that potent and all-merciful drug I am indebted for a respite of many years from my sentence of death. But I am feeling the penalty at last. My nervous system is shattered. My nights are nights of horror. Mr. Blake, have you ever been accustomed to the use of opium? No, I've never tasted it in my life. Were your nerves out of order at this time last year? <laughs> Were you unusually restless yeah. and irritable? Did you sleep oh, badly? Wretchedly. Many nights I never slept at all. Was the birthday night an exception? Did you sleep well on that occasion? I, I do remember I slept soundly. Now, can you assign any cause for the nervous suffering and your want of sleep? Oh, yes. To my leaving off smoking. Have you been an habitual smoker? Yes, since my youth. Did you leave off the habit suddenly? Yes. Your sleepless nights are accounted for to my mind. Now, did you enter into anything like a dispute with the doctor at the birthday dinner on the subject of his profession? Well, <laughs> I, I did attack the art of medicine with sufficient rashness to put even Mr. Candy out of temper for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> One thing more. Had you any reason for feeling any special anxiety about the diamond at this time well, last yes, year? Yes. I knew it to be the object of a conspiracy and... 
I was warned to take measures for Miss Verinter's protection as the possessor of the stone. Mr. Blake, if you read those notes now, you will make two astounding discoveries concerning yourself. You will find first that in all probability, you entered Miss Verinder's sitting room and took the diamond in a state of trance produced by opium. Now, secondly, that the opium was given to you by Mr. Candy without your knowledge as a practical refutation of the opinions which you had expressed to him at the birthday dinner what? regarding the efficacy of medicine in a case such as yours. You were rather blunt with him, I believe. <laughs> to my shame, sir, yeah, yeah, I was. You will see also from my notes that, but for his illness, he would have returned the following morning and acknowledged the trick that he had played on you. And the truth, which has laid hidden for a year, would have been discovered in a day. That was his intention. Now, I have something very bold and very startling to propose to you. We must put our conviction to the proof. For how? You shall steal the diamond unconsciously for the second time. I'll... In the presence of witnesses whose testimony is beyond dispute. You have resumed the habit of smoking, I see. Uh, yes, for almost a year since. And will you give up the habit again? Suddenly, mind, as you gave it up before? Ah, I see your drift. I will give it up from this moment. And if we can occupy your mind again with worries concerning the diamond, we shall have replaced you as nearly as possible in the same mental state in which the opium found you last year. In that case, it is possible that a repetition of the dose will lead to a repetition of the result. Yes. There is my proposal. And I embrace it willingly, sir. Then I shall write to Miss Verinder, if you will give me leave. Yes. And ask her permission to put my proposal into practice. Will she agree, do you think? Oh, I'm certain of it. And I am truly grateful to you, Mr. Jennings. If I can do you this little service, Mr. Blake, I shall feel it like a last gleam of sunshine falling on the evening of a long and clouded day. Miss Verinder willingly assented to my experiment being performed at the house and expressed her keenest desire to be present at that time. On the day of the experiment, she arrived from London, accompanied by her solicitor, Mr. Bruff. Are you Jennings? I am, sir. Is Miss Verinder with you? She is in the library. She has probably told you that I wish her presence in the house to be kept a secret from Mr. Blake until my experiment on him has been tried first. I know that I am to hold my tongue, sir. Being habitually silent on the subject of human folly, I am all the readier to keep my lips closed on this occasion. Does that satisfy you? Yes, thank you, sir. Very well. Is that Mr. Jennings? Oh, I can't treat you like a stranger, Mr. Jennings. Oh, if you only knew how happy your letters have made me. I am most gratified, my lady. Where is he now? Has he spoken of me? I am so excited. I have 10,000 things to say and they all crowd together. Do you wonder of the interest I take in this. No, I venture to think that I thoroughly understand it. You have relieved me of indescribable wretchedness and given me a new life. I love him. I have loved him from first to last. When tomorrow comes, and he knows that I'm in the house... When tomorrow comes, I think you have only to tell him what you have just told me. I beg your pardon, Miss... Mr. Franklin's very agitated uh, and wishes to know where Mr. Jennings uh, is. Will you excuse me? I shall go to him. Do, sir. I found Mr. Franklin restlessly pacing his room and a little irritated at being left by himself. Mr. Jennings, what happens now? You must concentrate on your fears concerning the Moonstone one year ago, for they were uppermost in your troubled mind that night, I believe. Oh, most certainly they were, sir. Rachel had strongly declined the locking up of the jewel in a safe place, and with the Indians skulking about the house, I was convinced they would try any means to steal it. Yes. And they would have undoubtedly used violence to achieve their end, which meant Rachel might be in mortal danger and the... Dread of that possibility was all I could think of. As it must be tonight. 
I sat with Mr. Franklin until it was time to prepare for the experiment, then slipped out of the room as he lay distracted, just as I wanted. I found Miss Verinder, Mr. Betridge, who had taken charge of the medicine chest containing the laudanum, and Mr. Bruff, who affected an air of complete indifference to the enterprise in the young lady's bed-sitting room. Mr. Jennings, how is he? As near as possible to the way he was one year ago, on the night of your birthday dinner. Mr. Jennings, I have the medicine chest here as requested. Thank you, Mr. Betridge. And now it is time to prepare the laudanum. Mr. Bruff, would you care to observe? I suppose so. I would trouble you to see me administer the dose, Mr. Betridge, also. I see. Anything else? Only that I must put you to the inconvenience of remaining with me in Mr. Blake's room and of waiting to see what happens. Uh, Mr. Betridge, uh, the laudanum, if you please. Yes, sir. Are you sure it will do Mr. Franklin no harm? Quite sure. And how long will it be before anything happens? Uh, an hour, perhaps. I suppose the room must be dark, as it was last year? Certainly. I shall wait in my bedroom, in the dark, and keep the door a little way open, as it was last year. And uh, you must have this, too. Ah. A crystal to represent the diamond. You must put it where you put the moonstone last year. It was here, in my Indian cabinet. And now... We measure the dose. There. My lady, if you would retire to your bedroom and extinguish the candle, Mr. Bruff, Mr. Betridge and I will administer the dose to Mr. Franklin. Uh, gentlemen... Right. Is it time? Yes, I have the laudanum here. Oh, let me have it. now. We wait. Oh, how much longer do you think, Mr. Jenkins, before there's some reaction? It has already begun. See how agitated he is. Huh? The Indian. The Indian. Uh, this What's he saying? It's not locked. The cabinet. He's concerned about the diamond. No, no, no. They can't lock it. They can't. Anybody could take it. Follow him. The diamond safe. The diamond safe. He's going into her room. Just went locked. He's going for it. He's going for the diamond. And perhaps now we shall see what happened next. He's dropped it. Pick it up, Mr. Franklin, sir. Pick it up. What's he doing now? Why is he lying on the sofa? Miss Verinder, you can come in now. It's all over. Oh. The sedative influence of the laudanum has overtaken the stimulant phase. The experiment is ended. Is he all right? He doesn't look well. He's so pale. He's fine. He'll sleep now. Do you mean to watch him while he sleeps? Yes. We have proved that Mr. Blake entered this room and took the diamond last year. Agreed, Mr. Bruff? Agreed. And I had hoped to discover what he did with the diamond after he left this room. He has failed to do that. So we have cause to lament a failure as well as to rejoice over a success. But we do know he took the diamond while under the influence of opium. Most certainly. Oh, and how I have wronged him. I beg your pardon, Mr Jennings, for having doubted you. You have done Franklin Blake an inestimable service. In our legal phrase, you have proved your case. Thank you, sir. Mr Jennings, let me watch him with you. 
I can't sleep. I can't even sit still or, or say yes, do. Of course, my lady. I must say, I'm amazed. I would not have believed it had I not seen it with my own eyes. Perhaps a drop of grog to steady our nerves, sir. Excellent betterage. Ah. <laughs> Good night to you both. Good night, Mr. Braff. Oh, Franklin, can you ever forgive me? One thing I know for sure, my lady. He can and he will. He loves you and wishes nothing more than for you to return his love. I do, sir, most ardently. I cannot believe all I said and did under the influence of the opium. It is a most powerful drug, sir, as I well know. Yes. Well, thank you again, Mr. Jennings. You've given me back my life. And now we return to London to find the final piece of the puzzle. What became of the moonstone? Exactly. I wish you well, Mr. Jennings. Sarah. Rachel. Thank you, Mr. Jennings, and goodbye. Thank you most heartily, sir. Goodbye. Bye. And with that, my brief dream of happiness was over. I had awakened again to the realities of my friendless and lonely life. Back again tonight to the dreadful alternative between the opium and the pain. But God be praised for his mercy. I have seen a little sunshine. I have had a happy time. Where's my lad? He should be here. Take my hand, Rachel. Thank you, Franklin. Sir, sir, Mr. Bruff, sir. Ah, here he is. Miss Venator, Mr. Blake, allow me to introduce you to Gooseberry. Gooseberry? Aye, it's on account of the extraordinary prominence of his eyes. Good day to you, Master Gooseberry. What news of Mr. Looker, boy? He's left his house accompanied by two plain clothes coppers. As I expected, he may be about to take the diamond out of the bank. Gooseberry, fetch us a cab. Yes, sir. See here, Mr. Blake? This is my man who has followed Mr. Luker here to the bank. What news? The uh, gentleman is still in the vault, sir. Let us wait, then. No sign of the engine. They must have their spy somewhere. Yes. You see that tall man there? Looks like a sailor. Could that be him? Sir, here he comes. Keep your eye on him. If he passes the diamond to anybody, he will pass it here. Mr. Luker slowly made his way to the door, now in the thickest, now in the thinnest part of the crowd. I distinctly saw his hand move as he passed a short man in a suit of sober grey. The man started a little and looked after him. At the door, Mr. Luker's guards placed themselves on either side of him. They were followed by one of Mr. Bruff's men, and I saw them no more. Could the man in the grey suit have it, do you think, Mr. Bruff? I don't know, sir. There's such a crow. And where has my man got to? And where has Gooseberry both left us at the time when we want them most? Oh, there's nothing else for it but to go to my office and await news. The news was not good. Mr. Luker had gone home and dismissed his guard, and there was no sign of the Indians or any other person loitering about the premises. He had passed the diamond on unnoticed. Before going home, I called at Rachel's house and spent a happy hour in her company. On returning home, I discovered that Gooseberry had called for me and waited, but had to leave for his night's rest. Accordingly, I was expecting him the next morning. Come in. Thank you, sir. Sergeant Cuff. Good morning, Mr. Blake. Good morning. I only got back from Ireland last night and read your letter telling him what has happened. Uh, there's only one thing to be said, sir. I completely mistook my case. I don't blame myself, but the fact is that I made a mess of it. Well, then you've come in the nick of time to recover your reputation. Take this envelope, sir. 
I suspected the wrong person last year, and I may be suspecting the wrong person now. Open the envelope when you've got at the truth, and then compare the name of the guilty person with the name that I've written in that sealed letter. Thank you. I'll come in. It's me, sir. Gooseberry. Ah, good lad. Now, you may speak before this gentleman. He is Sergeant Cuff, and he has come to assist me. Sergeant, this is the boy from Mr Bruff's office. Come here, my lad, and let's see what you've got to tell us. So, where did you get to at the bank? If you please, sir, I was following a tall man with a black beard, dressed like a sailor. Yes, I remember that man. And why did you follow the sailor? I saw Mr Luca pass something to him. Right. And the sailor went out in such a hurry that I followed him without telling anybody. Good boy. And what did you see? Well, sir, first he went to Tower Wharf, where he spoke to the steward of the Rotterdam boat, which was to sail next morning. Then he went to an eating house, but along the way... I noticed a man dressed like a mechanic, keeping the sailor in view and following him. I waited outside the eating house, and a cab came and stopped by the mechanic. Yeah. A man inside leaned forward to speak to him. He had a dark face, like the face of an Indian. Excellent lad. What happened next? The sailor left the eating house and walked, shadowed by the mechanic and me shadowing them both, to a public house in Lower Thames Street, the Wheel of Fortune. I went in and heard him ask for a room for the night. He was given room number 10. And where was the mechanic? At the bar, sir, taking in every word. The sailor went upstairs and I came here to tell you. But you were out. Oh, damn. We've lost time and it's my fault. What next, Sergeant? Our cab, sir, to Lower Thames Street. Yes. Not a moment to lose. the landlord about. He's upstairs uh, and he's not to be bothered by anyone. Come along with me, Mr Blake. You two, Gooseberry, room ten, you say? Oh, yes, sir. Sir, there are strangers here. Intruders, sir. What do you want? What's the matter here? What business is it of yours? Keep your temper, sir. I'm Sergeant Cuff. Oh, uh, <clears throat> oh well, begging your pardon, sir. We've been unable to rouse the gentleman and the door's been barricaded from the inside. So... I'm taking it off his hinges! Let's inspect the scene. Blimey, is he dead? Stay away, boy. This isn't for your eyes. Well, there's a pillow over his face. What does that mean? Is he in a fit? Or... He's dead. Oh. Send for the nearest doctor and send for the police. What a business. What's this? A small wooden box empty and there's a letter. Deposited with Messrs. Bush, Lysol and Bush by Mr. Septimus Luca, a small wooden box sealed up in this envelope and containing a valuable of great price. The box to be only given up on the personal application of Mr. Luca. So the sailor had the moonstone. Mr. Blake, look at the man's face. Yeah. There's a face disguised. He's pulling off his wig. Hush, boy. Mr. Blake, open the sealed letter and read the name that I've written inside. Godfrey Ablewhite. Now look at the man on the bed. It is him. My cousin, Godfrey Ablewhite. The marriage of Miss Rachel and Mr Franklin Blake took place at our house in Yorkshire on Tuesday, October the 9th and I had a new suit of clothes for the occasion. One of our guests was Sergeant Cuff, and on the Monday evening before the wedding, he gathered Miss Rachel, Mr Franklin, Mr Bruff and myself in the library to give us the final results of his investigation into the disappearance of the cursed Moonstone. Mr Ezra Jennings would have been there too, except that on the 26th of the previous month, he had finally expired of his illness at sunrise, in the arms of Mr. Candy. Our sadness at the news was only tempered by the knowledge that the long trouble of his life was finally at an end. My lady, gentlemen, please be seated. I shall bring you up to date with our latest discoveries, and I fervently hope 
resolve the mystery of the disappearance of the Moonstone. Amen to that. You are very grateful, Sergeant, for your perseverance in this matter. Oh, hear, hear. Well, it's the only honourable course left to me after my early mistakes. Let's hear it then, Sergeant. Very well. As to your cousin's death then, first, he was killed by being smothered with a pillow. The guilty persons were the three Indians who gained entrance to his room by the trapdoor in the ceiling. Their object was to obtain possession of the diamond. They left London the next day on the steamer bound for Rotterdam. Well, have they been apprehended? By no means, sir. They disappeared back into their country of origin, lost for all time to European justice. <laughs> now, with regard to Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite, it seems his life had two sides to it. Mm -hmm. The world knows of his charitable labours. The sign kept hidden exhibited this same gentleman in the different character of a man of pleasure. With a villa in the suburbs and with a lady in the villa. He, whoever would have believed it. <laughs> Indeed, my old friend. Mr. Godfrey had, years before, been appointed one of two trustees for a young gentleman and entrusted with the care of a sum of £20,000. This sum had been stolen and spent by Mr. Godfrey by the simple expedient of forging the signature of the other trustee. Nah. The young gentleman was due to receive his £20,000 in February 1850. Failing to raise this sum, Mr. Godfrey was a ruined man. What happened next is that luck presented him with the opportunity of saving himself and his reputation. The plying of Mr. Franklin's brandy and soda with laudanum at Dr. Candy's instigation leading to the loss of the diamond. Oh, if only I'd never suggested that brandy and soda. Oh, no. You have nothing to reproach yourself for, Gabriel. Well, of course you don't. Now, the story is cleared up by the testimony of Mr. Luca, the moneylender, when I interviewed him at some length. I first asked him how he came into contact with Mr. Godfrey. He turned up at my home, sir, and produced the diamond. He wanted to know if I would buy it. If that was not possible, would I undertake to sell it on commission and pay a sum down on the anticipated result? I asked him how he'd come by the diamond and he spun me an unbelievable yarn. I asked him again and he tried the same tack. So I bid him good day and upon this compulsion he came out with a new and amended version of the affair. Which was what? Having slipped the laudanum into the other gentleman's brandy, he went to his room. Later, he heard this gentleman talking to himself and checking to see what the matter was. He saw him steal the diamond as if in a trance. Still drowsy, the gentleman showed Mr. Abelwhite the diamond and entreated him to return it to the bank where it would be safe. He then fell into a deep sleep. And Mr. Abelwhite, amazed at his good fortune, took the diamond to his room to wait and see what happened in the morning. And we know the answer to that. Who would possibly suspect a gentleman of Mr. Godfrey Averwhite's standing of being involved? So, what term did you offer? I consented to lend him the sum of £2,000, on condition that the Moonstone would be deposited with me as a pledge. And he consented? <laughs> Not at first, but he soon realised that he had no other option. So I dropped the necessary documents on the spot. And there you have it. The answer to how the diamond came to be in Mr. Godfrey's possession, then in Mr. Lucas, then with fatal consequences into Mr. Godfrey's again. It was neck or nothing with him, if ever it was neck or nothing with a man yet. Oh, poor Godfrey. Poor Godfrey? Well, he almost destroyed my reputation and our love for each other. Ah, well, that's Miss Rachel's sweet nature for you, sir. She'll see the good in anyone. Just like a mother. Well said, Mr. Bessery. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and it is that sweet nature that I so dearly love. I'm sorry. Forgive me, Rachel. Oh, you've no need to ask my forgiveness, Franklin. Not now, not ever. <laughs> and my final duty is to reveal the contents of a letter I received from the esteemed traveller, Mr. Murthwaite, yeah. which casts some light on the fate of the Moonstone. About a fortnight since, I found myself in a certain province called Katiawar, and I resolved, before leaving, to look once more on the magnificent desolation of the sacred city of Somnath. On my walk there, 
I discovered I was not alone, by a factor of thousands, and I learned that the multitude was on its way to a great religious ceremony in honor of the God of the Moon, to be held at night. When we arrived at the place, we found the shrine hidden from our view by a curtain hung between two magnificent trees. Then a new strain of music, loud and jubilant, rose from the hidden shrine, and the crowd around me shuddered and pressed together. The curtain between the trees was drawn aside, and the shrine was disclosed to view. There, raised high on a throne, soared above us, dark and mystic in the light of heaven, the god of the moon. And there, in the forehead of the deity, gleamed the yellow diamond, whose splendor had last shone on me in England from the bosom of a woman's dress. Yes, after the lapse of eight centuries, the moonstone looks forth once more over the walls of the sacred city in which its story first began. You have lost sight of it in England, and if I know anything of this people, you have lost sight of it forever. In episode 4 of The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, Franklin Blake was played by Paul Rees, Sergeant Cuff by Kenneth Cranham, Rachel Verinder by Jasmine Hyde, Mr. Bruff by Bill Patterson, and Betteridge by Steve Hodson. Ezra Jennings was played by Peter Marinka, Mr. Murthwaite by Paul Battichargi, Mr. Luca by Stephen Critchlow, Rosanna Spearman by Alison Pettit, Lucy by Rachel Atkins, and Gooseberry by Harrison Webb. The Moonstone was recorded on location by Lucinda Mason Brown, with original music by David Chilton. It was dramatized by Doug Lucy and produced by Janet Whittaker. The Moonstone was a Goldhawk Essential production for BBC Radio 4.